Good to see all you guys. And everybody that's watching, good to see you guys. I know some of you watch on Sunday night. And uh, welcome. We're glad you're here. Everybody's all right tonight? Everybody doing good? I guess y'all studied your material. Did you, did you study your material? <laughs> I know y'all are probably going, you know, I forgot which one lesson it was. Yeah, I, I, and I can understand that because it's been two weeks because we, uh, you know, we had a little hurricane deal last week and, uh, and then, and we, we had kind of gotten off schedule just a little bit. Usually I do five, of e five each week and we had one week that I only got two because we had a lot of people talking that night. And uh, so anyway, which is fine. A few people talking a lot. And, uh, but that was fine because, uh, you know. Uh, so anyway, we've been off kilter, but we're right. We're back on kilter because the last week we finished with the mouth, with the last of the mouth. So we've looked so far at the 10 rules, uh, 10 commandments, 10 greatest thing that the Bible has to say about your mind, and then the 10 about the mouth. Now, tonight, we start the new section, which is money. Which we don't have. Nothing. Yes, which y'all really don't have any problem with, with the money. I know. No, right. Yeah. Shoot, man. Well, let's put it this way. Everybody in here but Bree, Bree's young. Everybody else in here is, uh, is at least my age, uh, which means we all you know, on up there a little bit. And if you hadn't got your money figured out by the time you get our age, you are in serious duress. I mean, I'm just wondering how you made it this far if, you, if your money's still messed up after this. Uh, I usually talk to, of course, you know, when you're talking to a church crowd, you talk a lot of times to young, a good mixture of people, some that are really young. Well, speaking of some young people, here they come. Here come some young people into the room. Uh, <laughs> Bree, you have some company here. Yeah, yeah. But uh, anyway, you're talking about the money. One of the things that I have found in, in the years, over the years, talking to mixed groups about money and then talking even to people personally about money, they're just all kinds of ideas and all kinds of functions that people have with their money. And... It, some of it seems a little bit odd to me uh, because I've, you know, Tanya and I have been married for 40 years. Uh, we practically grew up together. And we started out a certain style, a certain way of our money, with our money. And we've been doing that all our whole life. So somebody's, another way seems peculiar to me. Uh, Tanya and I have one bank account. Uh, we both, all the money that any, either one of us have ever had goes into that one bank account. I mean, we're, we're, everything I think we've done, you know, when we got married, we have one last name, we have one address, we have one mailbox, we have one, you know, right, and my last name, right, and not somebody else's. And anyway, so everything, what I'm saying about that is that everything in marriage is intended to move us toward being one. And so in our finances, it's not like she has her money and I have my money. We have money. And either we have money or we don't have money, you know. But we're, it's a we regardless. But then I know a lot of people that don't, you know, they have their own separate accounts. And they seem to function pretty good with it, uh, you know. So I guess there's really, I mean, I, don't, I wouldn't want to chastise somebody because they do things differently, you know. And... Um, just so it works out right, and it, you know, it, it seems to do that. Uh, some of the people in our church that uh, are great people and have great marriages, have been together a long time, they have that kind of situation. And I'm, you know, I don't know how they divide up who pays what. You know, like somebody pays a house note, and somebody pays a power bill, and somebody pays a, you know, water bill, and somebody pays, you know, whatever else, and kind of divide it out like that. Or whether some of it goes into a common account, and then they get to keep some of it. You know. Uh, that kind of thing. But anyway, I'm just saying that there are a lot of thoughts about handling money in marriage situations and family situations and so forth. And, and it, I, it, to me, it's not so super critical that you do it exactly like I would do it 
But these laws that we're looking at tonight and next week are just general uh, scriptural based uh, instructions, uh, um, thoughts, uh, patterns, uh, principles that money operates in, in the life of, of we as children of God. And the Lord tells us some, there are some really uh, great principles that will help us and bless us in financial areas. And that if we know these and then we pass these on, I've tried my very best to pass on money principles to my children and my, and my grandchildren. However, uh, it gets tougher all the time, really. I don't know this this world we're living in and th this generation of children, you know, we were talking this morning, we saw all our children up here and, you know, we've got lots of children, a lot of teenagers. And um, it just, man, I, I watched the life, I watched uh, financially how it, is, how it is for them and what they're coming into. And I'm thinking, man, how are they gonna make it? Because I know how expensive things are. and. You know, if you don't have a job that pays excellently, you're, you're not going to have enough to even have rent a house, much less have automobiles and, and other, uh, lug well, an automobile would be a necessity, but, but just have some of the necessities of life. And, you, and, if you, and you're going to have to marry somebody that has a good job, and both of you are going to have to work hard together even to have enough to survive it's you know back when we were growing up when all of us were set for Bree and Sharon and Mitch they all young but but us um, back when we were coming up man it was nothing to I mean I didn't even think about the fact when Tanya and I got married that we weren't going to be able to make it financially I mean it, that never really just even crossed my mind it was like Sure, well, we're going to get married, and we're going to have a home and a family. And you know, I mean, I didn't. I mean, it didn't even dawn on me like, you know, you might, you might not be able to get a job and have enough money to have a home or something. Uh, I remember our first, the first home that we owned, that we owned was a mobile home, a trailer, Miss Bell, and uh, we. Uh, <laughs> You know, now seriously, Beverly and Lawrence did not know until Katrina what a trailer was. Oh, you knew, but she didn't know. She did not, they did not know what a trailer was because their place, their apartment building was totally destroyed. Well, as a matter of fact, it wasn't even there anymore. There were 26 apartment buildings on the lot. There were like two-story buildings. And when we went back down there, there were only six of those buildings still there, mm -hmm. and there were 20 slabs yep. that looked like they had been swept with a broom. I'm talking no debris around them, no trash, no pieces of construction material, no automobiles, nothing. I mean, it just looked, looked, like, looked like you just took a broom and just swept things clean as it could be, and nothing was laying around or anything like that, and, there were, and 20 buildings were gone. And so they obviously didn't have a place anymore or any furniture or anything except the clothes on their back, you know, and whatever they were able to just run and carry out with them in their hands when they were running from the water because the water was chasing them. The water was coming up so fast, they almost drowned. Um, I mean, it almost overtook them. It was, it was coming up so fast. I mean, it was like this deep, and then maybe two minutes later, it was four feet deep, and two more minutes is seven and eight because down there on the beach, it was like 28 feet, the flood, the, the, the tide was. But anyway, the point is that uh, we, we've had to find a place for them, and we found a place up in the country and in the woods, and it was a trailer. <laughs> so sure it was, a, it was a trailer, and this, I remember Belle asked me. She said, "What's a trailer, Pastor?" You know, <laughs> I said, "It's a mobile home." Oh, okay, mobile home. Okay, I got it. you know, but we call them trailer. You know, you got to stay in a trailer. Well, Tanya and I, our first home was a trailer, and we bought it. It was used, and I can remember, still remember, it cost uh, our note was eighty-seven dollars a month, and uh, and we were wondering, man, are we going to be able to do this? <laughs> you know, eighty-seven dollars a month. And, uh, but anyway, but it didn't, didn't dawn on me, but nowadays, you know, good night. 
Uh, if you go to college, you usually come out of college with such a tremendously high student loan yep, yep, yep. Uh, because everything costs so, <laughs> is so astronomical in its price that uh, you're going to have to have a good job just to pay back your student loan. Mm -hmm. Much less, now you got a house, and you got groceries, and you got automobiles, you got whatever other thing. Yeah, I mean, good night. And uh, so I, I, we need to really pray for our, for our generations that are coming on now. And also, these <laughs> principles of finance uh, are just more important than ever uh, that we pass these things along. And I don't know if you have influence over your children or grandchildren or anybody that's coming up, but if you do, uh, you need to grab hold of these and let's see if we can pass some of this stuff on because I'm, I'm really fearful for what, what this bunch is going to face, you know, and how they're going to handle it uh, because it is just really something else. And making $7 an hour or $10 an hour, you ain't going to make it. I mean, you could have both of you making $10 an hour and you'd ha you ain't going to make it. And uh, I know it. Yeah, I mean, it's unbelievable, which is the first law, actually. <laughs> Bill, did you raise your hand or did you just praise it? Don't spend what you don't have. Yeah. Yeah, absolutely. Next thing is, like, you were talking about, like, when we were younger and all like that. Probably one of the first things that a girl's daddy wanted to know is, do you have a job? Right. That came before you were a Christian. Do you have a job? Right. And if you didn't, then uh, don't be asking for nothing. You got to hit the road. Right. Yeah, we. Uh, I and teach. It was just our mindset. That I love this woman enough, or this girl, that I'm going to take good care of her. Right. And, and that was just the mindset. Right. You work two jobs, three jobs, whatever you had to do. Right. You were going to provide for her. Yeah, that was our mindset, and um, I just, you know, I just wonder now. Uh, that doesn't seem to be the mindset of this generation, and it's very tough. I, I teach my grandchildren, uh, of course, my, my granddaughters, actually, more than my grandsons, because I, I just basically teach them it's their responsibility, man. you got to train yourself or educate yourself or do both or whatever to make yourself valuable and to learn skills and to... Uh, to make yourself in, you know, indisposable to certain jobs and careers, and right. so you can so you can make it and financially. But I, my granddaughters, and maybe this is sexist, you know, because mm -hmm. nowadays everything's got to be labeled. But uh, I tell them, look, the first thing, if you if you find yourself liking some some boy, you know, and he's kind of liking you, and and you think that you you know you might like to date somebody like that, mm -hmm. and uh, the first question you ask him is, where do you go to church? And the second question is, where do you work? And if he yeah. and if he if he stutters on either one of them, <laughs> goodbye. He ain't for you. And uh, so it's so funny because now they'll come, you know, Papa. I you know I I found somebody I, I like or whatever. He we're texting or whatever it is, and I'll say, okay, where does he go to church? Mm -hmm. And they'll tell me, and I'll say, and does he have a job? And they'll say, yeah, he works at so-and-so. So even as teenagers, you know, it's important. But, but it's a mindset, you know. I mean, it, it, it's, it, it's like what is really important. Uh, I mean, am I going to hook my wagon to somebody who's not going anywhere? I mean, am I going to hook my wagon to somebody that I'm going to have to try to, I'm going to have to try to, you know, uh, pride, uh, I'm push them and prod them and, and you know, uh, move them at all times to try to move forward in life or am I going to be, and, and they're going nowhere and my life's going to be hard financially and struggling at every point along the way or are we going to, are we going to move forward? Are we going to, are we going somewhere? Do we, do we, are, am I hooked to, have I hooked my wagon to, to one that's going somewhere? And uh, so it's really, it's really some critical stuff and I, I think the, these laws are, probably more important than ever because the Bible does have a tremendous amount to say about money, really. It's amazing how much the Bible has to say about money and about how to handle it and how to think about your finances. And it teaches us to be responsible and, and teaches us how we can be successful in handling, in handling our money. So let's just jump in. 
And of course, I know some of you already, you know, you've settled a lot of these in your life, so we'll just kind of see how this goes. First one is the law of contentment. Uh, in Luke chapter 12, Jesus is telling us that it's not God's plan for us to live a life of stress about finances. Luke 12 is the passage that says uh, the Lord takes care of the birds of the air, the Lord takes care of the flowers of the field, uh, seek him first and his, and, and, and his righteousness and then all these things will be added to you. Uh, he's really just telling us, look, don't get all stressed out about what's going to happen with your finances because God has, has, de has basically developed a strategy for you if you will put him first in your life. And the way you put him first in your life is by considering, I see some of you covering up. Are y'all cold? Are y'all all right? You can't go by me. I know, I know. <laughs> I know. Um, so yeah, yeah, let's, let's turn that one up. Uh, Bill, go over there and turn that up to about 80 on that side. Yeah, I'll turn it up, turn the temperature up. That way it'll make it go off. Yeah, yeah. But anyway, um, that the Lord um, intends for us to, be, to live a stress-free life about our finances. <laughs> and the number one uh, way of beginning to live a life with, of stress-free financial life begins with, uh, with our priorities, with the things that, that we prioritize in life. Uh, because life is not just simply the accumulation of stuff. So we have to set in our heart, in our mind, in our life, uh, a level of priorities. What is important? What do we need? How much is enough? Um, what do I need to seek first? And then what is my next priority? And what is my next priority? Because nowadays, for sure, we have a whole world that is that is pressing us and our children and our poster, uh, our posterity to be disenchanted with what they have as a matter of fact there's a whole industry that does nothing but try to convince <laughs> us that we don't have enough stuff and that we're we can't be happy unless we have something new and it's called the advertising industry Every commercial you see and every commercial you hear is in, has one purpose in mind, and that is to convince you that you can't live life without this whatever it is that they're pushing. Get this type of, you know, this is the new invention from Ronco. It slices, it dices, it does, you know. But wait, there's more. And they'll, they'll throw something in extra. I tell you, one of the most brilliant strategies I think that's happened uh, in the last few years in that kind of marketing it's, it is. It's just brilliant, and and whoever thought of it, I don't. You know, they. It's just a brilliant marketing strategy. Now, have you ever no, have you noticed on on all these kind of things on TV where you're being convinced you can't live without it? Um, it not only you can't you get this one, but they're gonna give you get, they're gonna give you a second one for free. Just simply pay the shipping charges. And the shipping charges are higher than the price of the product. I mean, it's like unbelievable. And, and, and so what they're doing is they're selling you two of them instead of just one of them. And they're hiding the price in the shipping and handling charge. I mean, it costs like uh, $15 for shipping and handling on a $10 item. I mean, it's unbelievable. But, man, that is just great marketing to just sell you one, sell you two of them, convince you that they're giving it to you for free and charging you twice as much. I mean, that is just a brilliant deal. Well, of course, what that, you know, that's the world that we live in. And what Jesus is saying in the law of contentment in Luke 12 is in, in order to uh, break free from that kind of mentality, you have to decide and what is important in life and what is it that you really do need what is it that 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 really 
you, you need to have. And, of course, you know, he's saying, seek first the kingdom of God. It's your Father's good pleasure to give you the kingdom. Invest in things that are beyond yourself. Your heart follows your investment. You know, that's basically what, what, uh, what Luke, Luke 12 is about. And so uh, contentment is, a, is an inside job. Um, if, you, if you're sitting here and your life is all about stuff and all about things, you're never going to be happy in life because you're never going to have enough stuff. I know we use Howard Hughes a lot of times when we use quotes from him because he was one of the more famous zillionaires of our generation. But oh, Howard Hughes was asked one time, how much is enough? And you know what he said? Just a little bit more. Just a little bit more. And so that's the, that's the thought process of a human life that has not, has not prioritized what is really important in life. What is, what is it that, that I, I need in order to live and how am I going to arrange the thought patterns of my life? Because if, if I go through life always desiring something else, then I'm always going to be spending more than I'm making because I've got to have more stuff in my life. Yeah, right. Chasing the Joneses, you know, but the jo but the Joneses refinanced, and you know now you're back behind them, you know. But uh, it's amazing how how prevalent the the thought patterns are. Of I mean, look at your teenagers. Look at you know some of you have some of them that are 16, 17 years old now, or or they're older than that. I mean, look at at what look at what they chase after, what they pursue what it is they think is valuable in life. And you get a chance to see, all right, here, here is someone who has no priorities in life. And Jesus said, here's your priority. First of all, seek me first. I mean, I mean let, let me be the leader of your life and, 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 and seek that. And if you will put me first in your life, then I'm going to give you the, the desires of your heart. I'm going to give you, it, it is your father's good pleasure, Luke 12 says, it, it is your father's good pleasure to give you the kingdom. In other words, God's promising us something. He's saying, if you'll put me first in your life, then a lot of these things that fall under, under me, I'm going to make sure that you have in your life. Like he said, the, look, the birds of the air, they don't, they don't build and, you know, they don't, they don't work for a living. And yet your, your father takes care of them and the lilies of the field or no, no amount of clothing has been so beautiful as that. But it's God that takes care of them. So if you'll seek me first, then, then I'm going to give you the desires of your heart. And, and that's where priorities, what is it that you desire? And if you seek him first, he's going to help you establish the priorities of your life, what is really important in your life. Because if you, if you don't set forth a, a, a pattern of what's valuable in your life, you're going to chase everything, and your life is going to be just pursuing one new thing after another new thing after another new thing until you finally, you know, get so many things you, you can't even function. Look at most of our lives. Look at how much junk we have that we thought we couldn't live without or that we thought would make life better for us or whenever we saw it, we just said, man, I got to have that. Look at, your, look at your attic. Look at your garage. Uh, look at your storage rooms. Uh, see what all is in there. Look under your counter where all that stuff is stacked up that is a gadget of some kind. <laughs> or how, and, and think how much money you spend on all that stuff, you know? The, the, especially electric devices and process. Have you, you know, the waffle iron and the grills and the George Foreman and, the, uh, you know, these little uh, uh, specialty machines that do specialty things that when you saw it, just, oh, man, that'd be great. Let's get, and it's twenty nine ninety nine, and you used it one time and it's been under the counter for five years and you can't get anything else under there because you got so much of that junk up in there. 
You can't even sell it in a yard sale. I mean, you know, people want to buy. We're the only country in the world where people have their garages full of stuff. You can't sell at a yard sale. And we have $50,000 automobiles sitting out in the weather because we can't get them in the garage because our garage is filled with that stuff. You can't sell at a garage sale. Well, what is that reflecting? That's reflecting the fact that uh, we want stuff. And so we have a hard time. We have a difficult time um, deciding what is important in life because there are a lot of people that really basically their attitude is, how much stuff do I really need? Well, uh, I don't know, but I need something else. And so anyway, the first law is the law of contentment, and contentment comes from the inside, and contentment comes from from pursuing the Lord and, and his righteousness, and all these things will be added. By the way, in... In Luke 12, one of the verses that it, it shares is, and I, I know you, you have your scripture sheet so you can see it, but the last verse of that Luke 12 passage, if you're looking at your scripture sheet, it says, for where your treasure is, there your heart will be also. Sell, uh, do not fear, little flock, for it's your Father's good pleasure to give you the kingdom. Sell what you have and give alms gifts to the poor uh, uh, resources. Provide yourselves money bags which do not grow old, a treasure in the heavens that does not fail, where no thief approaches nor does moth destroy. In other words, store up riches in heaven where thieves can't break in, where moths where you can't be corrupted and so forth. For where your treasure is, there will your heart be also. Just one little thought about that. That verse says that your heart follows your treasure. Did, did you notice that? For where, your, for where your treasure is, there your heart will be also. In other words, we have a tendency to think of it just the opposite. We have a tendency to say, what my heart is focused on, my money follows. But the Bible says what... what your heart follows your money. Your money doesn't follow your heart. As an example, you, you, have, you see a little piece of property for sale, and you drive by it every day, and it has a little for sale sign. Well, you know, after a few weeks of it or a few months of it, you see the little sign. Well, you, you just basically uh, get used to seeing it, and, 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 and you ignore it after a while. But if you buy that little piece of property then you'll never drive by it again without noticing it. Why? Because you've invested your treasure in that little piece of property, and now your heart, what you value, follows what you've invested in. And so the, the, the principle of contentment says, all right, we've got, to, uh, we've got to set what is important in life, and if we'll set what God says is important in life, it's going to be his kingdom first, and then we're going to let him decide what's important in life, what, what my heart follows and what I'm going to spend my money on. So um, if you can't be content, you're always going to be broke. That's <laughs> it's what I'm saying, because no matter how much you make, you can always spend more than you make. Well, that's the problem. And it's more exactly you right. More and, right, and it's because we just go wild when we have a little money, when we make a little money, when we think about, all right, we're making this much money, I'm making this much money, my wife's making this much money, and we both have really good jobs, we both are making a good salary, a decent salary for our good jobs, and together, man, we're going to be able to, you know, have a nice home, and we're going to be able to have nice automobiles, and we're going to be able to provide for our children, and so forth, and, and before you know it, you know, life's out of control for you. I mean, you've got way more bills, you've got a lot, and, and you're just sitting on the edge because you've allowed what you feel is important in life for you to have take control, and now you're on the edge of how much you can afford in life because you've spent money on what your beady little eyes see and want, and you know, and and you've and you've got yourself on the edge of of uh, 
of having too much to pay for. So now life becomes anxious. Now, you know, if you miss a day of work, all of a sudden you got a little hole in your budget. And if, if something unforeseen happens and let's say you got to miss a week of work, it's like, oh, no, man, we're going to crash here. So you're, li you're living life full of anxiety, full of stress about the fact that you have now allowed yourself to live right up to the edge of, of the resources that you have. Why? Because you, hadn't, you don't have any priorities. You've just thrown open the door and said, hey, let the wild horses run. And we're going to, you know, you think of yourself as being, of having a lot of resources because you didn't grow up with a bunch of stuff. I mean, I'm talking about things like, if you think about, think about this, back when we were growing up, and, and you younger people, uh, you just have to trust us when we say that, but back when we were growing up, I can remember the first job I ever had, the first, the first kind of real paying job where I actually got hired by a company to do something. I was a teenager. I was about uh, 15 years old or so, and uh, I got hired by a company, and they had to pay me minimum wage. You know what minimum wage was when I was 15 years old? A dollar 39 an hour. A dollar 39 was the first minimum wage I faced. And I can remember one week I almost made a hundred dollars. I mean, it was like 99 something like that because I had 60 hours that week. We, you know, for some reason. And I almost made $100. Well, man, I thought, good night, man, that's a lot of money. You know what I mean? It was when I was 16 years old, and it was in the summer and so forth. And, and, and so for me, you know, to begin to work as an adult, and I'm thinking I make $25 an hour, man, that's just like astronomical. You know, it's like, good night, man, that's going to... And, and in your mind, you're thinking... I'm going to have enough money to get whatever I want. And, and, you know, I can buy a car. I can get a play, you know, because you're thinking, 20, man, $25 an hour. And your mindset is that's a lot of money because look at where it came from, from $1.39 an hour, now I'm making 25 So it's hard for you to tell me I need to be careful because I can spend way too much because my mindset is now I have plenty because, Compared to what I used to have, boy, I mean, I'm just way up there. But before you know it, that can get out of hand because you, you're not content in your heart because you don't have priorities that, that are based on something that the Lord says is stable and secure. So I, one of the things, one of the lessons I think that we, we need to learn, of course, I mean, like I said to you older folks, if you don't know it by now, I'm not sure uh, you're gonna gonna get it. Uh, you probably already have it, or else you wouldn't be here. You know, <laughs> you'd be somewhere else uh, on the street, you know, or something. But uh, but we really have a responsibility, I think, if, as much as possible, that we encourage our young people and our young couples to to seek God's kingdom first and to set some priorities in life so that you can learn to be content with what you have, that life is not just about getting new stuff and having more stuff, because if that's your mindset, life is going to always drag you into more stuff, and sooner or later, the stress levels, the anxiety levels, the work levels, all of those kind of things are going to, are going to push you to... Uh, have to have anxiety and issues in your life and that, that affects your relationships and affects your marriage it affects your home it affects everything in your life and, and and life begins to kind of crumble down around you because of all those kind of issues so the first law of finances is jesus says hey be content learn to be content with what you have learn to be content with what you need and seek him first, and then all of these things will be added to you. All right. Any observations about that? I mean, obviously, you've learned that, right? Yeah. I mean, it, sometimes it might have been a hard lesson, and it might have taken a little bit of time, but that's the first one. All right, so that leads us to the second law, and that is the law of budget. 
Now, if, if the anxiety level in here went up just because I said the word budget, that means something. That means you probably don't have one and you don't want me to try to convince you that you need one. <laughs> Uh, you guys probably do. How many of you have, and I'm not going to chastise you or anything, but how many of you have a budget that you live by? Okay. Is it, do you have it written down? Most of you, have, you know, have raised your hand. Do you have, it writ, do you have it written down, like, you know, and, and posted on the refrigerator or something? I mean, or, or something. You got it memorized? <laughs> yeah. But you got one, you have it in a book? Yeah. Yeah, we, you know, you would expect that with Pastor Tanya, that I, we have one too, and uh, we always have, but it's, uh, a, a budget is just simply a plan, is all it is. I mean, a budget is not something that strictly controls your life. A budget is just, um, it just reflects uh, what it is that you have so that you'll know where you are in, in your finances. You know, I've had people, uh, seriously now, there are, there are young people who don't even know what a budget is. I mean, seriously, we, I think we need some classes in high school that's called common sense or daily living, you know, where they teach you how to make a budget. Yeah, yeah. It's called consumer math, really? Well, that'd be great. Because I guarantee you, yeah, yeah, how to write a check, how to balance your checkbook, uh, you know, how to, how to create. I put in your notes, uh, I put a budget in there, like a sample that you could use and just fill it out and fill it in. And, of course, it reflects your priorities. And I put the first priority is God, all right? So he's, we're going we're gonna to put our tithe in there first, and then we're going to have to make room for Uncle Sam because uh, he's going to get his part and he's going to put you in jail if you don't give it to him. So that's a really a high priority. And then come the expenses that you are going to have to have to live off of. And then at the bottom come the, uh, the incidentals and the things that you might uh, want in life and so forth. And so that's how the budget reflects itself as it comes down. And I know you guys have these kind of thoughts and you've set your life up and you're spending up based on that but you'd be shocked at how many people do not have a budget whatsoever they have no idea where their money goes if you ask them why don't you have your rent money they will they will not be able to give you an answer because they have no idea where their money went Right, it's like when I get my right. It's like when I get my check on Friday, and you know, I mean, just arbitrarily pick a number of the checks, the checks for four hundred dollars. I mean, it's like good night, man. We got four hundred dollars, and you go down to Walmart and you begin to, you know, walk down the aisles, and you just and you get whatever your beady little eyes see that you think you want, and when you come out of there, you've spent about two hundred and fifty of that four hundred dollars. And you got another whole week and, uh, and a half to live before you get another check. If you go to work every day and you don't get sick and you can, you know, make it. And before you know it, you got a lot of month at the end of your money. And, and so you, they don't strategize about the fact that we have to pay $400 a month for our rent. If, I mean, I know that's laughable. You know, you couldn't find, you can't find a, you know, a FEMA house for a four hundred dollars a month, but but anyway, let's just we're just picking numbers out of the air. But you know, you got four hundred dollars a month. That at the end of the month, you got to give somebody four hundred dollars for where you're living. Well, you can't just go out when you get a little check and spend three four three fourths of your money, knowing that at the end of the month, your whole one whole paycheck would have to be used to just pay your rent. You got to save a little bit every time you get a check and put it aside so that you can pay your rent and your power bill and your water bill and all the things that it takes to live. And then when you set all that aside, then you'll know you have it and, and whatever's left over will be, you know, what you have left to spend. But it's amazing how many, that little simple concept right there, that's what you guys live by, right? I mean, that's what you've done just naturally all your life. It's like, 
who wouldn't know that? I mean, who, who wouldn't who wouldn't think of that? Well, I tell you what, a lot of these a lot of these these people and these people and these people and I have no clue of what you're talking about. And uh, and you have to you know you have to teach that kind of stuff and. And uh, we need some we need some classes or something to be able to start teaching. This is normal life, okay? This is what this is how stuff works. Uh, I, I it's amazing how many people have any of you ever been on a benevolence committee at church? Bill, you have. <laughs> All right, Bill has. Uh, yeah, I'm gonna tell you if you were on the benevolence committee, it's gonna really change you. Uh, that's why we don't even have one here at our church. Uh, we don't have any benevolence committees. Uh, basically, you know, Pastor Tanya and I and our board of directors, uh, if there's anything that we get requested for by somebody that's part of our church, then we consider it, you know, independently. And the only, and cause I don't want you guys to get, <laughs> I don't want you guys to get all burnt out over, over these things because it is ridiculous. Uh, I guarantee you, and, and they can testify cause they've been on them. You'll have people that will come because they they owe last month's rent and they've got just about half of this month's rent. So they, they're really two months behind and they're gonna have to pay the whole, you know, seven, eight hundred dollars plus the seven or eight hundred dollars for this month. So they got fourteen hundred dollars worth of rent they gotta pay and they got a hundred and fifty dollars saved up, you know, toward it. And they need something, you know. They need the re they need some help with the rest of it, and then you start talking to them about, okay, well, let's just see what has happened with your money. Let's see, you know, because I mean, this is something that uh, obviously is an issue, and we don't want this to keep being an issue. So let's see if we can go over this, so we can start helping you know how not to let this ever happen to you again, and you'll find out that they have stuff like cell phones and they got unlimited this and unlimited that and unlimited that and their cell phone bill is $125 a month and then they got cable TV and the cable TV calls, calls, yeah, <laughs> they do what? They got expenses, yeah, that's right. And then they got cable TV, and the cable TV cost 125. They got internet on that, and then and the TV is probably 150 dollars, 140 dollars a month. And then you know they they have fancy, they have the latest uh, iPhone 8 and all this kind of stuff. And in, in, in other words, you start looking at what they're spending money on, and you're saying, "Good night, man. No wonder you don't have any money." You've got all of these luxuries of life. Do you know you can live without internet? I mean, it's like, oh my Lord, you know, <laughs> people nowadays are like, are you kidding? Uh, you don't have to have cable TV. Uh, you don't have to have the, the latest and greatest, fanciest phone and most expensive services and all that kind of stuff. But it's amazing. They have all of that and they can't even pay their rent. It's, it's like, are you thinking, man? I mean, you're going to be out walking on the sidewalk here in a minute, but you got a cell phone. You, yeah, right, sleep <laughs> under your cell phone, you know. Yeah, look, don't get luxury expenses until you can handle the expenses of life, like somewhere to live and something to eat and, you know, maybe a little bit of electricity for yourself and a little water and all that kind of stuff and, and, and know what you need before... You start getting your money so you can put aside some of it in order to have it when you need it. But I'm serious. There are people who really don't have any kind of concept. And I know y'all are finding that hard to believe. But am I telling the truth about oh, yeah. that? Oh, yeah. I guarantee you. And what you want to look at them and say, how stupid are you? You know, I mean, what in the world are you thinking about? You really want to chastise them and really belittle them and just berate them. Because now they're asking you to finance their uh, ignorance and finance their irresponsibility of life. Now, you know, here's the way I feel about stuff. As long as you pay your own bills for what you have, well, I don't have any right to criticize you. I don't have, because you're not asking me to pay for you. You're paying your own way. Okay, if you ask me what I think, then I would be obliged to tell you. But just for me to come up and start chastising you is ridiculous because 
you're paying your own way, and so you can do what you want to with your finances. I'm not involved in it. But when you come to me and ask me to help you pay for your life, now all of a sudden I've got a right to kind of get in there and dig around and bomb around because you're asking me to pay for what you're doing in life. Uh-oh, now we got a horse of a different color. And what I want to try to do is be helpful so that it, this won't happen anymore. Because I guarantee you, if some of the priorities of your life don't change, it's going to keep happening over and over and over again. And even though you make good money, you, you're wasting your money. You're, you're, you, don't, you don't put aside. I've actually used this method. You know, there are all kinds of methods that you can use to budget with. But I've actually used this, and I know this may sound funny, but I've actually said, all right, look. Uh, you, you, you can't grasp the concept of, uh, of putting your money in the bank and then kind of keeping a ledger maybe over here separately in your, in your checkbook and you, you put the deposit in and you just list some of it in, in this account right here for, for house note. And even though it's in the same account, you have a little bit set aside so you know, okay, I can't spend that. And then you put your power bill and you put your water bill and you put whatever, all those resources. So it's still in that one account, but you've got a separate ledger so you'll know how much of that you can't touch. And it's amazing, you know, somebody can't get that. So here's what I've, do, I've done. I said, all right, get you, get you about four or five socks, old socks. All right, we're going to get your paycheck. We're going to cash it. And then we're going to put this one right here that says house note. This sock says house note. All right, we're going to put in out of every check however much it takes to, for, to pay the house note at the end of the month. So we'll put it in there. And then we're going to name this one power bill. And then we're going to take a little bit of cash and we're going to put it in power bill. And then we're going to take water bill and we're going to put it in there and it shows you water bill. And then whatever resources it takes to keep your house, we're going to have them in this sock, this sock, this sock, and this sock. And then this last little sock down here is money I can spend. And you put it in there. And when you, this sock gets empty, you are finished with your spending <laughs> for the month. You don't ever go back and all right, you don't ever go back to this sock because you're gonna you're gonna need everything in this sock to pay your house note, and you're gonna need everything in this sock to pay your power bill. So you can't go back to a sock that you have already paid. This little one over here that says money I can spend, that's the only sock that you can spend. And when that money's gone, then you can't spend anymore. That's the end of it. But but it's you know, so you have to get real, you know. But that's the law of budget. Yeah, Bill. Yeah. What? On that same line, uh, you have to, like with the benevolence and all that kind of stuff, you have, even with your own children or whatever, pay rent to whatever, whatever. Right. You have to not become a crutch for the environment. Right. But become a teacher. You know, make a right. learn from it. Right. Say, so, okay, now this is it. Right. Do it again. You know, one of the most difficult things. Yeah, it's, hard, it's hard to do, I know. It is. But I, I tell you, you know more about my life than anybody in here. And, and I've got, uh, you know, there's people that will, you can give them $1,000 on Monday and Friday they'll be broke. Right. And sure would. There's people like that that would just never Sure happen. would. Yeah. But I, I'm always reminded when we talk about benevolence, there was a guy I called one time, called the church, and the secretary said, Mr. Billy's right here, so she can send me. You were on the benevolence committee. Yeah, he said, I'm so and so, and then I came down to Florida to help my mother. They had a storm down there, and the uh -huh. wind blew a bunch of limbs and broke trees and all that. And he said, I was down here cleaning it up. And uh, he said, You don't miss so and so? And I said, Yeah. He said, Well, I'm her ne nephew. And I said, Good. And he said, uh, <laughs> Good. I was out here cleaning up, and I lost my wallet. That always happens, man. And he said, uh, These people lose everything. And he said, uh, And I really don't have enough money to get back home. Yeah. And I said, well, how much do you need? And I said, I don't know if he said $100 or $200. I said, okay. I said, but now, your password, and I've talked to you about this before, is going to be Joy, J-O-Y. Uh -huh. If you don't know that, you won't get the number. And I said, you know what J-O-Y really means? He said, no. I said, that means Jesus over you. Mm -hmm. Maybe that'll make him do right. <laughs> Jesus over you. Nah. <laughs> never heard of him, never seen him. <laughs> of course, I sure wasn't going to ask his poor old aunt for it. You know. Yeah, right. Oh, I didn't even tell her about it because I didn't want her to get offended. Yeah, right. 
But you have to be careful because we met people that were like weekly people. Oh, yeah. You become a crutch. I mean, they, just they make a living. The church of the day. Right. And, and, and one more quick. We, we used to give out meals for, uh, for Thanksgiving. Thanksgiving. Yeah. Well, me and Big Daddy, he's gone now, so he don't care if I use his name. But anyhow, we, we would have a turkey and then we would have all the fixings for Thanksgiving dinner. And we would go places and hand them out. They would tell them they from Bo Baptist Church and World Right. You know, just try to be a good witness. And I'll never forget Big Daddy said, Okay, man, it's your turn. So I got out. I looked at my friend, the lady came I don't know if she had a cigarette hanging out of my mouth, but it's probably did. <laughs> and uh, I said, I'm Billy Woods, and I'm from the last church. And we're here to live it up. And uh, she said, uh, she just kind of laid down there against your mother's box. She said, You mean I got to cook it? You mean I got to cook it? And I thought a whole bunch of different things. <laughs> yeah, right. <laughs> And I told Big Dad, like, I'm about to call. I said, the rest of you are something else. <laughs> that is it. I'm finished with it. Yeah, you, mean you mean I got to cook it? Yeah. I thought of a lot of things she could do. Right, yeah. <laughs> 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 I thought of a lot. I'll never forget that. Oh, my goodness. Well, you know. <laughs> right. When you see him on the corner, right. I got a cigarette. Right. Or a dog. Or a dog. Or a dog. Yeah. And, and oh, yeah. I need money to... Food. Right. Well, put that pack of cigarettes down and don't get any more. Yeah, say so how much that costs? Four dollars a pack? Yeah. Yeah, I mean, yeah. It, and, and see that's what that's right. That's see that's what I'm talking about. When you when you have a budget, it tells you it's like a gas gauge in your car. How many of you have ever driven an automobile or a vehicle where the gas gauge didn't work? Yeah. Uh, do you, so do you ever feel, do you ever really feel comfortable, <laughs> you know, I'm, yeah, right, it's like, do you ever feel comfortable, yeah, like, you're looking at it, and, and, and you're always a little bit anxious about, ooh, what, got, what if I run out of gas, you know, so a gas gauge, all it is is, a, is, a, is an instrument that reflects how much gas you have before you are, are going to have to start walking. Right, and so a gas, ga I mean, a budget is the same thing in your finances as a gas gauge is in your automobile. It doesn't control what you do. It just reflects how much you have left toward what it is you need. And so, you know, it's uh, a lot of people think of a budget as, you know, good night. It's like a horrible thing. But really, all it does is reflect what it, how much you have left so that when you think, okay, I want to spend a little money, do can I spend it? Do I have enough? Will I have enough to? I mean, it's just really a very simple question in life. It, you know, Jesus yeah. taught this. Yeah, yeah, Jesus taught it in uh, in Luke 14 when he said, "Look, nobody, no person ever starts building a ha a home unless they first consider the cost to see if they have enough to build it. Because if you get it half finished." everybody's going to look at you and you're going to become a laughing stock. You, you're going to be considered a foolish person because you got your house half built because you ran out of money because you didn't consider how much money you needed before you started building the house. Or he said, no, no king goes to war with another kingdom unless he first considers, all right, how big is that army? How big is my army? Do I have enough to fight against them? Because if you don't do that, you're going to get halfway through the battle and your people are going to be running for their lives because you've made a poor choice about attacking a stronger enemy than you. And you're going to have to try to make peace with somebody now who has the upper hand and it's going to hurt your people. So Jesus is teaching us to know what we have before we ever start on a, on a project so that we can... Make it all the way through the project. So budgeting is something that the scripture teaches us to do with our, with our resources to consider what we need, look at what we have, know where we are all along the way so that we don't, when we, when we get to the end, you know, we don't have more month than we do money and, and, uh, and live that way. Because there's nothing that brings anxiety levels up in a home like running out of money. Now, I'm going to tell you, uh, nowadays the divorce rate in first marriages is, is 40 to 50%.
oh, basically one half of the people that get married the first time end up in divorce. And, and most of the time, one of the number one issues is money. When the finances get tight, everything gets tight. Man, the feelings get tight, the short tempers get tight, the anxiety level goes up, the stress level goes up. I mean, it, it's a real killer in relationships. And, and, and so money, I mean, it just seems so mundane. And I know we as God's people, because, you know, you guys obviously have lived a lot of life and you've made it and you've, you have these principles in you, you know, or else you wouldn't be alive right now, most likely. Um, but you've, and you've conquered them. And, and, and I know it's hard to imagine that some people don't know anything about what I'm just talking to you about. You would think anybody would know this. This is like a simple survival of life kind of thing. Like, like if you're born in this earth and you live to be 18 years old and you don't, and, and, and you survive, you would know this, but it, that's not true. Uh, it's unbelievable. And so somebody's going to have to bail. And one of the most difficult things to do is to have somebody that you love hit you up for finances because they did not discipline themselves to control their life so they don't outspend their income. If your income, if your, if your outgo exceeds your income, your upkeep will be your downfall. Well, if your outgo exceeds your income, then your outgo, then your upkeep becomes your downfall. It, yeah, that's it. But, but uh, so many people don't do that, and it's hard to tell somebody you love no. Have you ever had to do that? I mean, it is. It's very difficult. Now, if you don't have the resources to do it with, it makes it a lot easier because you can say, I'm sorry, baby, I just don't have it. I, I would give it to you if I had it, but I just, I don't have it. But for you to have it and then to say no is a very difficult thing to do. So I'm just encouraging you, man, train them up, <laughs> train them up early so that, you know, you don't have to say no. And I, Cause I don't mind uh, with, with, you know, people that we love and people that we, you know, we, we want to try to encourage and people that, are struggling and they're and they're working hard and they're and they're trying to make it in life and and they get a little out of kilter with their finances you know I, you don't mind giving them a, a leg up but a handout is a whole different thing you know I, I would love to I mean if, if I can bless you and and this and this resource can give you a leg up and you can learn from it and you can grow from it and you can say all right, I'm not going to let this happen again, and you make some adjustments, and you do some living, and you get faithful, and you discipline your life, and you set some priorities. That, that would be fine if you could do that, but so often that's not what happens. So often you just become a crutch, and I'm going to tell you, they're going to spend all their money, and they're going to spend all your money, and both of you are going to be left out in the cold. So the law of contentment and the law of budget First two laws. Let's do, let's do another one. Uh, this one may sound a little funny. The law of fish. The law of fish. I know you're going to say, what in the world? It's the law of fish. Well, the law of fish basically says that um, what you need in order to survive or prosper is most likely right at your, right at your disposal, but you don't see it. In other words, God can provide some things for you and supply some things from you, and they can be right at your feet and you not see them. And so uh, the law of fish is that, uh, that God will provide for your need, and you just need to open your eyes to see it. This is where Peter, the uh, Lord speaking to Peter, and he says, uh, Go down, to the, go down to the sea and cast your hook, and the first fish that you pull up um, is going to look in his mouth, and there's going to be a coin in his mouth, and you're going to be able to pay the taxes for me and for you. 
And that's one of those funny little miracles like, good night. What a, you know, what's Jesus concerned about here? Well, he's concerned about the fact that they owe some taxes. And so Peter goes down and, and pulls the fish up and, of course, gets the silver coin out. And he goes and he pays the taxes. And so the Bible is filled with examples of God providing for a need right there with, and, and it be all around you, and yet you don't see it. Uh, God said basically, look, open your eyes and, and let's, see what, let's see what you have that you can use in order to uh, provide for yourself financially. I mean, it, it, with Abraham and Isaac, you remember it was, he took Isaac up to sacrifice Isaac, and the Lord said, uh, you know, okay, I see that you're responsible, I see that you're faithful to me, so uh, there's a ram over there caught in the thicket, and there, and so there was the sacrifice right there uh, with Elisha. You know, he went in to the, to the town, and he saw a widow woman with a little cruise of oil and some little meal, and he said, what are you doing? She said, well, I'm going to cook this oil. I've got this, all I've got left is this little oil and this meal, and I'm going to cook a little, a little pone of bread for me and my son, and we're going to eat it, and then we're going to die because we don't have any more resources. And he said, well, uh, make one for me first. And sh she did it. And then he said, do you have any, do you have any, any pots? And, and she's got all the pots that she had, and he went over to the little oil container and he started pouring oil into the pot and filled up all of the bowls of her whole house filled up with oil God provided for that she because she provided for the king for for the kingdom of God for for Elisha uh, Elijah was sent by God to the brook Cherith and the ravens came and fed him every day you know at the on the mount uh, Philip was asked by Jesus, hey, let's feed all these people. And he said, Lord, we don't have enough stuff. We don't have. And he said, well, let's just go see what you do have. And they brought five, five loaves and two fishes, and they fed all 5,000. In other words, the Bible's filled with examples of the fact that God can provide for needs with resources that we don't see. So the law of fish is that there may be something right around you that can provide for your need that you possibly have never considered in life. And you say, like, what kind of things are you talking about? Well, I'm talking about, um, do you have a skill? Is there something you can do? What do you like to do? Is, yeah, is what you like to do? Yeah, is, right, right. Is what you like to do valuable? Can you make something that possibly could sell? Uh, nowadays, with uh, with the internet and eBay and all of these other services online, there are lots of things that people are interested in buying. And you you might have a good hobby that could provide something that somebody might want to purchase in life. Uh, what's in your garage? Is any of that stuff valuable? Uh, you know, is there is there something up in your attic that uh, you hadn't thought of that you could look and dust off and clean up a little bit and and sell it, you know, and make a little bit of resources off of that? Uh, do you have services that you could offer? Would somebody be interested in paying you for doing something that uh, you have time enough to do and you have the skill to do and, and it's, it's worth something to somebody else? In other words, look at your life and say, what else can I do? If you're, if you're in need of resources, what, what else can I do? I mean, I, I work at a job, and I'm, I'm making, you know, money, but, but I don't have enough, and, I, and I'm having trouble making it. Well, what else can I do? In, in King David, I, I, I have a whole series on uh, working hard for a living, and it's about King David's life. And uh, when he was a boy, uh, let, me, let me just read the, this passage to you because it's, uh, it, it's indicative of what I'm talking about. In 1 Samuel 16, this is a couple of verses, and I'll, and I'll show you. This is talking about, about David. Um, and he sent and he brought him in. Now, this is a description of David. Now, he was ruddy. Now, ruddy just means he has red hair and freckle. All right, he was ruddy and of a beautiful countenance. Listen to the description of him. He brought him in. Now, he was ruddy and of a beautiful countenance so that and handsome. And the Lord said, Arise and anoint him, for, for this is he. He's talking to Samuel about anointing David when he was a boy. So look at the description, all right? He's a good-looking young man. 
He's handsome. He's got, a, he's got a nice countenance about himself. All right, this is the next verse. Then answered one of the servants, Behold, I have seen a son of Jesse, the Bethlehemite, he, description, who is skillful in playing, second, a mighty, valiant man, third, a man of war, that means he's a good fighter, uh, a pr and prudent in matters, which means he's diplomatic, he's got good relations with people, and an agreeable person, and the Lord is with him. But notice all those descriptions of David. Look, he's a good-looking guy. He's handsome. The Lord uh, has blessed him. He's an agreeable person. He gets along with others well. He's a good diplomat. He's a good soldier. He fights good. He's uh, agreeable. And the Lord is with him. So what, is, what that's basically saying is, all right, uh, whatever you have, whatever blessings you have that the Lord has given you in life, work them. Use them. Dave, every bit of that is a description of a young man that tells you why he's valuable to someone else because of all those skills that he has. And so the more skills we have, the more abilities we have, the more likely it is that we're going to be able to use some of those to provide resources for us and our families. So if I'm working on a job and, and uh, I'm making a certain amount of money for one of those skills and I have other skills, develop those skills. Uh, push those skills. In other words, if you've, God's blessed you with it, work it. You know, Put your makeup on. Look nice. I mean, if you're a beautiful person, Take advantage of that. I mean, that's part of the gifts that you've given, you know, that God's given you in life, and work it, man. Don't don't leave don't leave these opportunities on the table, so to speak. But but look around you and be aware and be conscious. And when you pray and ask the Lord for resources, or you say, Lord, I I, I need I got I can't I got to have some help. I'm I'm, I'm broke. I'm, I'm man. I'm, I'm destitute, and I need resources in life. Then the Lord looks at you and says, okay, uh, we got some resources. What else can you do? Yeah, look around you. What, what else can you do? And, uh, and the Lord will use those opportunities. So the law of fish basically says when you pray and you ask the Lord to help you, uh, pay attention to what, what, what is around you. Pay attention to the things that God has put in your life uh, to give you an opportunity to have more resources uh, that others, don't, that others don't have to uh, carry you, carry the load. All right? The law of contingency. Law of contingency is the fourth one. Um, the law, that law just basically says, look, um, what if what I'm thinking is going to happen doesn't happen the way I'm thinking? Uh, the law of contingency says uh, I need to prepare for what might happen if what I'm thinking is going to happen doesn't happen the way I think it's going to happen. Now, honestly, and I know this is ridiculous, but there are people who think that it is unspiritual to plan for the unexpected. They think it's a lack of faith. You know, it's like, okay, I'm a Christian. I trust God. I believe God. And so whatever happens in my life, God's going to God's going to see me through. I've, I've had guys actually, now seriously, and you would, this is really unbelievable to me, the, the thought pattern of this, but I've had people feel like to have life insurance is, is almost like an insult to God. It's like, you know, the Lord's going to take care of us, and the Lord's going to take, if something happens to me or something happens to her, then the Lord's going to take care of me. And if I have life insurance, it's basically an insult to God. Like, I don't believe God's going to take care of us. Mm -hmm. And I, to me, it's, it's ridiculous to think like that. Because, I mean, it, 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 you know, what my response to that is, is do you have a spare in your, in your trunk? Mm -hmm. Well, yeah, why? Well, why do you have a spare in your trunk? Well, if I have a flat, I don't want to be sitting beside the road. I said, uh-huh. So it's okay to prepare for having a flat tire, but it's not okay to prepare for the future of your family if you aren't here anymore. The reason you have a 
spare back there is because in case you have a flat tire, you will have the resources right there to fix the flat tire so you're not sitting on the side of the road with everybody buzzing by you. Same way with life insurance or preparation for retirement or whatever it might be. Um, one thing you know in life is you're going to die. How many of you think you're not going to die? Well, I mean, if you're, if you're here when the Lord comes back, which every generation since he left has believed that they will be here, which I believe the Holy Spirit probably gives us that encouragement to believe that. But so far, none of them have been right. So far, every one of those generations have gone to be, be with the Lord rather than him coming back. So, you know, the chances are you're not going to be alive. But the, the, everybody dies. So you don't just think you're going to die. You are going to die. And what happens, with, what happens with your family after you're gone? I mean, I had somebody say, man, I'm not going to get any life insurance because uh, if I do and I die, my wife's going to be left with, you know, uh, $500,000 uh, and, and man, all the guys are going to be after her for her money. And I say, well, at least she will have a choice. <laughs> you leave her with no money and three kids and all that responsibility, how's she going to pay for that? She may have to try to find somebody in order to survive. And she might have to, you know, settle for something that's not real true love or, you know, because her survival is just dependent, man, because she doesn't have any resources and she's got a lot to supply for. You leave her with a little money, at least she'll be the one who gets to choose. You know, <laughs> if, if, if there's four or five of them, she can take whichever one she likes because of that. But, it, you know, the, the law of contingency just basically says be wise enough to plan for the unexpected in life because we're all going to, we're all going to have unexpected. I, the old folks, and when I say old folks, I'm talking like, like me and you, you know, <laughs> the old folks in life used to say, you know, put something up for a rainy day. That's what we called it, rainy day. And, uh, and, and because rainy days are going to come is what, what it's basically saying. And but you know, there are some religions that think they should stockpile stuff. Oh, yeah, hoarders. <laughs> have, you ever, have you ever been to a hoarder? Yes. Oh, yeah. Yes. It's easy to see, isn't it? <laughs> you had to move a hoarder? Did you ever get all the stuff oh, gone? No. <laughs> <laughs> I went in when I, when I worked for AT&T, seriously, y'all. I went into a home, um, and this was just one example. I had quite a few, several of these. But one of them particularly, I can remember, I went into the home to install some AT&T products, and I had to put them in every room, every bedroom, and in the den. And when I walked in, even the kitchen now, even in the kitchen, there were boxes and little and pieces of furniture like, you know, cabinets or chest of drawers or something that took up, you know, some space and, and boxes and, and things that were stacked on every wall. So I walk in, I walk in through a little entryway and I walk in and, the, and I'm in the kitchen and their kitchen countertops and the stove and refrigerator stuff and stuff stacked up on top of the counter of the of the of the uh, kitchen and all the way around the whole thing until there's about a like a six foot square right here in the middle of the room that doesn't have anything in it and then i walk into the den same thing's true on every wall stacked up almost from the floor probably as high as you can reach all the way around the whole room there's about a six or eight foot little section right in the center where there's nothing then you go down the hall it's all stacked up you just got a barely little narrow walkway to walk down the hall then you go to the bedroom and in every bedroom seriously every bedroom you walk in stuff stacked up on every wall all around Right in the middle of the room, there's about a five or six foot little square spot that nothing's in, and that's it in the whole room. Can't even see the bed or anything like that. And so I looked at whoever was leading me around to show me where they wanted things. I looked at them and I said, you know, I'm going to have to get to the wall like right down there. And so you're going to have to move all this stuff out of the way for me to get down there. You know what they said? Seriously. They said, can you, can you, just, can you just put it in? you know, 
like it is? And I said, well, yeah, I can. I can drill a hole right up there on that wall and just run the line right down and just run it right. They said, well, do, yeah, do it that way. And I did, man. I went outside. I just drilled a hole through the wall right up there above all that junk, and I just ran the wire over the top of all that stuff right down to the middle of the room. And all the room, they were happy as could be, and that would work for them, you know. It's amazing how ridiculous. I don't know how we got off on that on contingency, but, but anyway... But anyway, plan plan for stuff that um, that happens that that you don't you don't know might happen. And let's get this last one tonight. The, the fifth one is the law of excellence. The law of excellence best uh, really basically says that you can save yourself a lot of money if you take care of what God's already given you. A um, couple of pointers. Number one, automobiles last longer if you maintain them. Uh, if you put some oil in there, those motors <laughs> seem to run a whole lot better. You know? <laughs> yeah, and change that thing every once in a while so that when you take the, the dipstick out, it, it'll actually, you know, be pliable on there rather than be pasty, you know. Um, uh, you got to keep the fluids up, you know, in the automobile. Uh, you know, it takes a little water to cool the engine. It has a transmission fluids. If it has an automatic brake fluid, you know, make sure all that's done. Uh, the tires roll better if they've got the correct air pressure in them and all that kind of stuff. And occasionally you may have to touch them up a little bit. Um, air conditioners run better when the filter's changed every once in a while. Uh, where where it can move air through a filter. I, I've seen some nasty filters, I'm serious, man, about that thick with dirt and stuff, and I'm thinking, how does that thing even breathe? But it works, it doesn't. Uh, leaky pipes don't tend to heal themselves. Um, if you let them stay leaking, they're going to just keep leaking and get worse. And uh, if you'll clean up things and organize it in a way that you can find stuff if you need it, it's going to really be helpful when you're working on something. Some people have stuff just thrown all in the little shed or in the workshop or whatever you call your, your place. And when you go in there to find something, it takes you about 45 minutes to find it because it's over there underneath something that else that you've thrown in there. And that's on top of something else that's been thrown in there. And you know you got it, but you can't find it. You know, and you just, yeah. And every time you walk in there, you're just going around trying to look for stuff you can't find. I mean, organize it. Put it in a place where you know it is. And then when you need it, it, you don't have to spend time looking for it and trying to move stuff out of the way so you can get to it and get it and use it. I mean, this is the law of excellence. It's basically, why should God give you more when you don't, when you don't use properly what he's already given you? you know? I mean, let me ask you this. Have you ever given somebody something that was valuable to you and you saw them treat that with total disrespect. They don't upkeep it. They don't maintain it. They don't seem to value it at all. All right, how did that make you feel about what you gave them? It hurt. Yep. Right, hurts your feelings. Exactly right. You that much, you just right, hurt you because you gave them something valuable and they have no respect for it at all. Now, how did that make, how did that make you feel? about ever giving them anything else. Wouldn't do it. Wouldn't do it. All right, so imagine that. Now think about that and think about God and think about you. If God has blessed you with something and you treat it with disrespect and you don't take care of what he's given you, how do you think God feels about that? Uh, how do you feel about that? All right, did, does it encourage you to give it to them again? Give them something else? No. It encourages you to say, okay, you don't respect the things that you own your own, buddy. Um, and, and the passage just encourages us to make sure that we take care of the blessings that God has given us because why should he give us more if we don't take care of what he's already given us? Maintain your stuff. Yeah, maintain your stuff. Keep you, and thank him for it. Yeah, and, and use what he's given you wisely so that uh, the opportunity can come again for you to have other stuff in life. Right, because right, because after all, I know a lot of times the attitude is, well, I paid for it and I bought it. Well, who gave you the health to be able to go to work? Exactly. Who gave you the opportunity to have strength enough to, to make some money out of your life and to have skills and to have a function? And I mean, the health to be able to do that. 
It belongs to God. God gave us all of that ability. And it can be gone in a moment, you know? I mean, one little bubble goes to the right place and boom, you know, you can't think anymore. You, you, you can't walk anymore. You can't, I mean, your life is very fragile uh, on one hand, is very powerful on another hand, and it's God who holds our life, our health, our, our abilities, our finances in his hands. And so treat with respect the things that God's blessed you with because um, if you want more, then treat what you have as valuable and treat it with excellence. So there you go. There are the first five, first five laws of money in the scripture. Teaches us how to be responsible, be content, have a budget, look around you, the law of fish, and see what else, see what's right around you that could provide for you. The law of contingency says prepare for the things in life that might happen that you don't think might happen but they might happen so you'll be ready and prepared for that and then treat the things that god has given you with excellence if you want god to give you more all right all right y'all got any observations about that any questions about that anything that... no <laughs> y'all did y'all did great y'all are... hey we're going to get out on time for one time it's amazing yeah all right any Anything? Yeah, right. It's a miracle. <laughs> Who would have ever thunk it? <laughs> All right. Well, you know, the reason why is because I'm really talking to people, I think, that probably do every one of these. Um, you know, I'm not sure about our young ones. Bree, what about you, baby? Are you, do you pretty much do all these? Uh, <coughs> yeah. Pretty, pretty much? Yeah. Well, when we were talking more on, like, with the budgeting and everything, when you were talking mm -hmm. more about the Right. Uh, on that point, I mean, uh, to be honest, I, I never touched a checkbook. I don't know how to use one. My parents never kind of threw it at me to learn it. Right. I didn't learn it in school. just didn't take the classes. So pretty much how I do with a lot of my finance stuff is, okay, I have a lockbox. Yeah. Anything that I make, I mean, I have separate envelopes. Okay, this goes towards this, this, this. Same and thing. Have, Same like, thing. My spare is more of emergency instead of just blow money. Right, yeah. So if something does come up, I might go ahead. I'm not sure it's up, so now I just pull it out of there. So that's, that's kind of like how I do that. That's great. But, uh, that's way, that's a beautiful, beautiful way to do things. Yeah, so I'm going to work with like the savings and everything because I do eventually want to be able to save a real good amount of money. Right. So if I, I do want to blow something up. Right. You know, That's really right. You know, it's, it's really amazing because now I'm 62. So, you know, I've started looking at um, the things that through my life, you know, the 401ks and different things that, and retirements, working for companies. And, and in other words, I'm looking at all of the stuff that I have as resources because it won't be long that I'll be able to start drawing on some of those things if I want to without penalties, you know, and so forth. And, and uh, so I'm looking at them, and I'm, and I'm thinking to myself, man, if I had just put even a few dollars more, starting, you know, 40 years ago, if I'd have just put like $5 a week, boy, man, I'd have way more. I mean, it'd just be, it's amazing how much more you would have, just a few dollars more. Uh, by the end of 40 years, it, it's, a, it's amazing. So, you know, when you're young, it's hard to visualize that. It's hard to see that that's going to really be a real big issue. And you have lots of time. So if you put just a little bit, it really begins to add up over the years and so forth. So whatever it is you can afford, if it's only $5 a week or something like that. I mean, do that. Do everything you can with your savings to try to, you know, lay aside those things because there, there'll be a time where it'll be necessary. Plus, um, well, I was saying, you know, if you don't see it, you don't miss it. Right, right. Yeah, that's right. If you don't see it, you don't miss it. Yeah, if you can get it taken out of your check before it ever gets to you, you'll be, you'll be doing good.
always glad that we did it. Right. Because we wouldn't have it today. And yeah. We, and we were blessed that we worked for a government, I think, our government the state. The state, and that we were able to to have that choice of doing that. Right. And, and met so much of it and everything yeah. like that. Yeah. So it's we, good that you had an opportunity to do that. And uh, a lot of people don't, but if you'll just take care of whatever you can, it'll, it's amazing how much that'll accumulate. All right. <laughs>